This is the Movies of 1999. I am Jason Hutchins. And I'm Craig Talbot. And in this episode, which is our pilot, we're going to be talking about the concept of the podcast because we won't have any movies to review yet. So quite a few years ago, I think mid-pandemic, I found out that a lot of people consider 1999 to be the epitome of uh, Western cinema. Um, Basically, a lot of small independent productions became mainstream and started being shown on in the big multiplex cinemas and all the audiences sort of shifted to watching movies that these days look fairly experimental. And all of the big Hollywood movies that were bankable in the 80s, audiences stopped uh, showing an interest in those. So it was a big transition for cinema. So I thought when I found out about this that I'd put together my top 10 list just as a personal um, project. But I quickly discovered that it was hard to find just 10 movies that I, I enjoyed from that year. Um, I think just looking at my DVD collection, I had 13 movies that came out in 1999. So the list started growing and growing and, and soon it approached 26 movies. And I thought, well, that's pretty good as there are 26 fortnights in a year, so maybe I can watch one every year starting in 2024, which is the 25th anniversary of the year 1999. But then it also became apparent that there was a whole bunch of movies that didn't make my list that were still good movies, but I just didn't consider them to be representative of of the year 1999. Maybe they were a bit more mainstream. So I started compiling a second list. And I did this over the course of maybe 12 months. And I've actually ended up with two lists and a list that now numbers 52 movies, which I would consider to be good representations of 1999 cinema. I'm going to stumble over the word 1999 quite a bit, I think. It's almost like a tongue twister. So that's my A list of, 19, uh, of 52 movies. And then on my B list of of still very good movies, I have another 52. So what I've done is I've gone and paired movies from the A list with movies from the B list. Now, I don't want to give away too much what movies are on the list. But uh, as an example, um, Run, Lola, Run is on the A list, and I've paired that with Runaway Bride on the B list. So there's always a theme with the pairing. And what we're going to do is... Running away running away from something. So um, what we're going to do is every Sunday evening, we're going to have a movie night at my place and we're going to select a number between 1 and 52 at random. And then we're going to watch a movie on the spot from the list that I've compiled. And then in the following week, uh, as optional homework, people can watch the B movie that is paired with that A movie if they like. In order to do the selection, I've got this bingo machine, which I'll just go and grab. It's a a $10 special from Kmart, but it does the job. And it's got this great little hand crank. It's a bit hard for you to see, Craig. Um, Right. I can can see it. Yes. But but if you can hear, I've got 52, 52 balls inside this machine, each with a number on. And what we'll do every Sunday is... We'll have people over for a movie night. I'll hand crank the machine. Um, A ball will fall out at random. And we'll use that number to look up my little spreadsheet of movies. And I've gone through and made sure that I have access to all 52 movies. So we can start watching one um, on the spot without having to track it down. Most of the movies are available on streaming services. Or they can be rented from Google or Apple TV. Um, There were a small number that I had to go ahead and buy the DVD because there was no way of finding it uh, on any streaming service that can be accessed uh, from Australia. And I think there were three movies that I couldn't even get the DVD for. So I've had to um, go back to the early 2000s before streaming services, um, back when 
you know, my, my weekly movie fix was to go and download a movie from somewhere. So I've had to do that in three instances. So we'll mention those as we come to them, because they, they were too obscure even for um, streaming. I mentioned that I've got an A list and a B list, but I also have an F list of movies that went over that 52-week uh, limit. And I think, Craig, you've been looking through my F list, have you? Um, I certainly have, and there's a bit of controversy between us over the F list, I think, Jason. So, uh, yes, I have definitely been looking over the F list, and um, I'm allowed to talk about the F list, I believe. Is that right, Jason? Please go ahead. Um, The movies on the F list will not be screened at my house, but I must say there's a couple on there that I've never seen, but I'm curious to watch them, so I'll be interested to hear what you have um, to say. There's some pretty uh, there's some pretty big name movies in the F list, and one of the things that I really noticed with the F list is that the number of excellent actors and actresses that there are on the F list. So 1999 was clearly a really really busy year for lots of very famous people, and that's the thing that made it really interesting. That if these are the people that are on the F list, then the it's going to be really interesting to see who's on the uh, on the A and the B list movies. I uh, certainly starring in. Um, there are some uh, incredible actors, some people that were uh, well household. Well, almost all of these people are household names. So uh, we have the End of Days uh, with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't think there was a bigger name in the nineties than Arnie. Uh, Inspector Gadget had uh, Matthew Broderick in it. Forces of Nature, another movie, um, had two big household names, certainly in our household. Sandra Bullock was uh, like the rom-com queen of the 90s and probably the 2000s as well. Ben Affleck, still still a big star. Uh, Antonio Banderas, um, who's probably most famous for the Zorro movies, starred in a movie called The 13th Warrior, along with Omar Sharif, so the older... The older people in our audience will remember Omar Sharif. Now, well, admittedly, well, Omar Sharif. I think I remember Omar Sharif mostly from Top Secret. Do you remember that movie? Oh. Like someone assass- tries to assassinate him by putting the car that he's in in one of those garbage compactors. So, and he oh. enters the room, sort of inside this this metal cube of crushed vehicle. Right. Um, okay. One of the well, most hilarious he's... movie moments ever, I think. Well, he's most famous for the Lawrence of Arabia, of course. Um, the Bone Collector had Denzel Washington and Angelina Dolly in it. Never been kissed. Now, this is a very controversial one, I have to say, Jason, because uh, I I was very surprised to not see this on the A or the B list because, I mean, Drew Barrymore, mm. absolutely huge actress. Uh, probably had a bit of a crush on her back in the 1990s, have to be honest. Don't tell my wife. Um, but she, uh, she's, not, she's on the F list, Jason. Well, Poor old you know, Drew. That, that's just the way it goes. You know, I, th- th- this is my personal um, taste in movies reflected. One thing I, is I've really tried to avoid franchise movies, sequels, um, you know, very mainstream movies. So the A list of 52 movies for me is really trying to say something about the state of cinema in 1999. Whereas a lot of these movies on the F list, they could have been released the decade before or the decade after, and you wouldn't blink an eye. They're, you know, they're fairly mainstream by that, in, the, in that regard. Yeah, it's certainly true um, that a, quite a few of these movies are probably also hangovers from 1998. So I, I think you might be onto something there. So when I was doing my research... Um, I did notice that quite a few of the movies were delayed releases from 1998, directors and writers fighting with each other. The 13th Warrior in particular, there was a lot of argument between Michael Crichton and the director of uh, The 13th Warrior, and, and, they, and the actors were quite frustrated because at one time they would be reshooting for the director, and then the next day they'd go and reshoot a scene for Michael Crichton, and the two mm. scenes were completely different. It looks so, like they were trying to share directorial duties on that movie. Yeah, and so what ended up happening is the Michael Crichton version was the version that got released, but there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a cult following for The 13th Warrior, apparently, 
and um, there's been a push for many years to see the director's cut of the 13th warrior. So that's a, that's a movie that I hadn't really heard of before doing the research here. And I actually haven't watched it all the way through, but uh, like you were saying, that's one that uh, given all the controversy around it um, and, you know, Ant- Antonio Banderas being the, the hunk that he is, uh, he sort of carried the movie, but there was a bit of controversy in the, uh, in that as well. And, and from a 2023 20, perspective, um, it's interesting because Anti- Antonio Banderas played a Muslim character. And right. It was actually quite a good Muslim character, a Muslim character who was, um, you know, sensible and prayerful and not a, not a, not, not the negative characters that we've often seen in cinema in years since. But of course, uh, Antonio Banderas is Spanish and Christian. So, he played a, a Muslim, an Arab Muslim, which I don't know if that would fly today mm. in mm. in our modern sensibilities. Uh, an example of what do, what do we call that? Cultural appropriation, I guess. Um, yeah, I think you're right, and and that's a really that's a grey area for me. I think because obviously, you know, when an actor is performing um, in a drama, they are taking on a persona that may clash with their real life persona. You know, it is a grey line. Um, you know, actors do play outside of type quite a lot, but you're right. The world has changed in the last 25 years, and I think it's not the last example of something that may feel a bit weird to watch uh, in retrospect. Uh, there's certainly um, some examples of actors and directors and producers who have been cancelled in the years since, and it will be hard to avoid um, those names when we come around to spinning the bingo wheel. Yeah, I don't think there's um, any very controversial people in the F list that I've found so far. Now, did you mention? Yeah. Did you mention um, my favourite Martian? Because that's one that really rankles me. Because oh, okay. the great, the great Christopher Lloyd uh, is in that movie. You know, from the Back to the Future trilogy, but also the movie Clue, or uh, based on the board game. And uh, he's also in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Said so just a great actor, and that's that just totally bombed. Um, so it was disappointing to it's disappointing to no, be reminded okay. that that movie even existed because it had been flushed from my memory. And it's only when I was uh, doing this project that I I was reminded of it. But the fact that you know he chose that role and it was such a horrible movie, it's quite depressing, really. Yeah, I I did notice that. Um... Even in the trailer for the My Favourite Martian, it does appear that Christopher Lloyd pretty much carried that movie. Yes, you know, he has. He has a similar sort of. I, actually, I didn't notice. But I didn't realise before, but he's a bit like Robin Williams. You know, you put Robin Williams in a movie, and it automatically becomes a Robin Williams movie. You know, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He, he's the and and Christopher Lloyd in uh, My Favourite Martian. I think if it wasn't for him, the movie would have been. Uh, well, it was ordinary, but it would have been even more ordinary. Um, like he's literally in every scene in the trailer, uh, so he's obviously the the, the character um, carrying the comedy of that movie. It's meant to be a mm. comedy. Um, I'm not sure if it, <laughs> it comes off as a comedy in the end, but it, it's, it's pretty uh, much an odd odd couple story, isn't it? Yeah, Jeff Daniels plays the straight guy, and. Um, I don't know that he's the greatest actor in the world. I don't, I'm not quite sure how Jeff Daniels keeps getting uh, kept getting work, to be honest, because he's a pretty he's a pretty boring actor to watch. But maybe that's what they wanted in this movie. I'm, I think at the time he wasn't as well known as he is now because he was on the Aaron Sorkin uh, TV series, The Newsroom. I think right. that's really when I I sat up and noticed Jeff Daniels because his opening monologue for that, which you can watch on YouTube, is just wonderful. I think it says something about the movies of 1999 that I selected 104 movies to watch over the next 12 months. And these movies just didn't make the cut. And any other year, these would have been blockbuster movies, you know, The 13th Warrior, um, Mm. End of Days, uh, Wild Wild West is on the list as well. These are... These movies have blockbuster potential written all over them. Big name actors, big name directors, big budgets, and they just didn't make a ripple. 
Well, it's interesting because, like, uh, one we haven't mentioned here is snow falling on cedars. And um, I know in my family, the women in my family, uh, my mother-in-law and my wife, um, absolutely love that movie. Now, I, I've got to be honest, I've never watched it. Um, but it's uh, it's another movie uh, which has got a very strong following. And again, I think you're right, in another year, it may have well been a pop movie. But in 1999, I guess there was just so much for the critics and whatever to uh, to see that it didn't get a didn't get a look in. Talking, talking about snow falling on cedars because that's a um, very much a romantic Ethan Hawke movie, isn't it? But I was just looking that yeah. up, and and that was directed by the Australian Scott Hicks, which was he was known for Shine, and Shine was probably one of the precursors to these nineteen ninety nine movies, where I think that was exhibited at Cannes or Sundance or something like that, and created a big buzz at the time, and was probably one of the first um, big alternative Australian movies that that broke it. Um, over in Hollywood, you remember Shine? That that was the story of that guy from yeah. Perth. Um, yes, the, yes, piano, the player. piano player. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, Shine. Shine was a big movie. I like uh, Snow Falling on Cedars. For some reason, has is a a big uh, a big movie in my family. Though it's not one that I I would have probably come across otherwise. Um, I noticed there's another another one here called Cruel Intentions that I must admit I don't know a huge amount about. According to IMDb, that's it. That was a that was a fifty four percenter. Mm. So that's got our our Sarah, Sarah Michelle Geller um, and Reese with with a spoon in it as well. I mean, again, Sarah Michelle Geller was probably you know she was at the height of her powers in the nineteen nineties, uh, coming off uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. A, a, a huge, a huge favourite of uh, my household. Um, I don't know how you went with the whole Buffy and Angel series, TV series, but um, mm, yeah, in it our didn't house, really it cross massive... my path. Um, right. I think Cruel Intentions was based on Shakespeare, maybe Taming of the Shrew. Was it? No, it wouldn't be that. Um... Uh, it could, it could have been. Uh, that's probably one. Maybe we can talk about another time. I'm not sure. I, it's not. It's. It's about. Uh, it says that the uh, the blurb says two vicious step siblings of an elite Manhattan prep school make a wager uh, to deflower the new headmaster's daughter before the end of the term. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So, the, mm. That's actually um, an interesting one because I think Ten Things I Hate About You is also a ninety nine yes. movie and has a similar plot in some ways. Yes, well, that is definitely the taming of the shrew. And things I had about you. And, okay, uh, okay, that maybe know, that's where I was getting it from. Yeah, so uh, and and that maybe when it comes up, I'm sure I'll have a few things to say about. It. I think I've seen that movie probably more One than million any times. of the others in <laughs> more than any other in the 1999 uh, list. But yeah, uh, the F list is a is a very interesting list. Actually, it's um, as you said, it's very much a personal thing. It is. Um, they all. I, I do notice that all of them score pretty poorly on the uh, tomato meter from Rotten Tomatoes. So I'm sure this is not the, the the last time we'll be mentioning that. No. Um, the average score seems to be around about 20%, and some of them are lower. So there are That's a right. few in the 50s. Uh, but again, there it's an interesting list. Uh, it's actually it was actually quite interesting going through and um, seeing the number of movies in that list and. It, and you know movies that you've heard of, even though they're not particularly good, like the Mod Squad. Um, that's probably about that's probably a remake of another movie. That poor old movie got three percent. Mm, I think that was a yes, yeah, yeah. That's a terrible score, mm. but that's an example of trying to revive a franchise. The Mod Squad, I think, was a TV series. It was yes, um, yes. So they were trying to revise that, modernize that. Um, turn it into a movie that would probably, if successful, have gone on to spawn a bunch of sequels. And yeah. again, with, with young actors, big name actors, um, trying to make it edgy, and that just didn't work. And mm. I'm not sure whether that, that was a leftover from the earlier 90s. Um, maybe that had been a successful formula in the past, but it certainly backfired on them. But I would be interested I'm... to to rewatching some of these movies and 
some of them I'd yeah. be watching for the first time. The list itself is, you know, all my leftovers. The the you know, so it is very miscellaneous in in that sense. There's no theme to the list, I guess. No, no. Um, I I do wonder. I, I don't know if I'm I'm probably foreshadowing a little bit here, and I'm I'm pretty sure this will come up. But I do wonder with uh, 1999, one of the reasons why it was such a great year is because that was one of the the years before, you know, before Netflix, before streaming, before, uh, you know, the, the change in the industry that's taken place over the last, what, I guess, 10 years or so, yeah. or probably longer. Yeah. What, how do they refer to TV shows uh, like the, these... Um high quality TV shows like The Sopranos and The West Wing. Both of both those shows got started around 99, uh, 2000 did, yeah. as well. Um, prestige TV, yeah. And yeah, I, The West Wing, for example, had a lot of, um, you know, Martin Sheen, a lot of stars in it. I mean, I know that that was a show, talk about a show that was loved in my household, like, that was yeah. probably my favourite yeah, show we, of that era. We've rewatched The West Wing yeah. um, several times. Yeah. But, but yeah. also the advent of DVDs, the fact that you could go out and buy a whole season on DVDs and the size of that um, DVD box was probably around the same size as a single video cassette. So you could have the entire yeah. season. Um, in West Wing, they were making these old-fashioned TV series which had 26 episodes per season instead of these days it's more common to have eight or 10 or 12 episodes in a season, but you could have the yeah. entire season on your shelf um, and pull it down and rewatch it uh, and binge it, which is, I think we first started doing that in the early 2000s, binging an well, entire season. I know DVD players came out in nine. I saw my first DVD player in 1996, but I don't think it started to really gain traction. I think you're right until the end of the, the end of the century, basically, that DVD players got cheap enough and accessible enough that, you know, everyone started to have one in their home. I mean, the the quality of VHS versus DVD is, you know, enormous. Yeah. Uh, so VHS, I mean, you look at VHS video. In fact, even looking at some of these trailers, the quality of a lot of the trailers are obviously are being published on YouTube back in 1999. Well, They're 360p. And that's their maximum quality. And I kept going to adjust the settings bar in YouTube because the quality was terrible and then realising it's already playing at the best quality. Yeah, um, but, but you, so, must, you must remember this was six years before YouTube started. Oh, um, is that right? Yeah, so okay. these trailers weren't being released on YouTube or any video streaming service. You would have had to click on a link to download them to your local machine. Um, right. decompress them probably and then watch them in, in some video player on the desktop. And and they were so very would... low resolution. Yeah. I, I remember downloading probably the trailer for Lord of the Rings, which came out uh, af after 1999. But I remember downloading that and leaving the download going overnight and um, having this postage stamp size uh, video playing on my desktop. So it was a different time in that respect. But going back to DVDs, I think quite a few movies that were released in 99 became classic DVDs. Like the, the idea of producing the DVD um, was part of producing the movie. So they would film a lot of behind the scenes footage um, with the intention of putting that on the DVD. They would film like these mini documentaries about making the movie. And then, of course, the director's and cast members would record um, uh, audio tracks, audio commentary tracks. So when you were watching the DVD, you could listen to them talking about the filmmaking process. And I think that that really got started in 1999. Uh, and the idea of buying a DVD and watching the movie several times so you could listen to all of the commentary tracks, that's something that we've lost with streaming services. But that was a big thing in my life for a while. And it was really insightful to listen to them to listen to the mm. filmmakers talking about their craft. Yeah. So, so it was an interesting time. Things certainly did change. Um, we, we were living in the before times, you know. Uh, this was before, like a lot of people had this fear about Y2K, you know, what was going to happen. Yes. 
you know, we, we're on New Year's Eve uh, 2023, but New Year's Eve 1999, people, you know, some people were, were thinking that the world was going to come to an end because all the computers well, would stop working. I was actually on, uh, in 19, on this day in 1999, I was actually on call for the next day because I was a software developer back then. And uh, we had spent the entire year fixing our systems to uh, the computer system that I was uh, working on, the warehouse distribution system, so that it could handle the 2000s because we had only, our system up until that point only had two-digit dates. And so I was on call today in 1999 because we were worried that a lot of our systems were going to fall over. We knew that they weren't because we'd done the work. But, you know, like you were saying, we were very nervous. So I remember being on call for uh, uh, the 1st of January 2000 and hoping that nothing went wrong. And I'm pretty sure it was a a big non-event, as I recall. And I think what people don't remember is that the reason why it was a non-event isn't because it was blown out of proportion, but it's because a lot of people like you, they work very hard to fix all of these problems so that there yeah. wouldn't be an issue when the, the, the year rolled over. Yeah, that was, literally, that was literally my job for 1999. That's literally all and my four or five colleagues in the development team that I was in. That's literally what we spent our year doing. We didn't do pretty much anything else in 1999. We may have done some feature changes and whatever, but they were very, very small. Uh, we basically spent the year, I can remember, going through with a fine-tooth comb and finding every single date field and updating it and changing it and recompiling the software and checking it. And um, the, the software that we had was so horrible that we actually had to increase the size on the screen of the year field because it had only been a, a narrow two. I, it, it, brings back, it brings back memories, but it was quite a process because we had to be really methodical and we had hundreds and hundreds of pieces of code that we had to go through. So thousands of lines of code. Anyway, that, now, that, that was 1999. So to get back to, to talking about movies, um, mm. there's a couple of movies on the F list that I'm really curious to watch because I, I never saw them at the time. I didn't, in fact, know that they existed. So one example is Breakfast of Champions, which is a Bruce Willis movie. Mm. And, and he, of course, was a big star at the time. And... This is another example of a movie that bombed, and it bombed so hard in the US that it never got a theatrical release in Australia. It was a straight-to-video release, and that's perhaps why I didn't know about it. But I do like Kurt Vonnegut's stories, and Breakfast of Champions is an example of, of one of his books. Yeah, And, and that looks I'd... like a really interesting movie. It, it's got Albert Finney, Nick Nolte. It's sort of told in a very interesting way, so I think I'll track that down yeah. and watch it. I think you're right. That did look like that's a movie that I have heard of before. I haven't watched it, but um, I did notice um, doing some research on it that um, it. I wonder if maybe at the time Bruce Willis was definitely known for his uh, his particular type of roles that he had, and this is a very different role for him. He's sort of a bumbling, struggling character in this movie, where he's a he's a famous TV presenter, and he gets stuck in this town, and Everything seems to go wrong for him, as far as I can tell. I'm not giving the way, way of the movie too much, I don't think. He's not the in-control uh, character that we've seen him play in, like, all the Die Hard series, for example. Mm. So he's a very different character, and I wonder if uh, perhaps audiences weren't quite ready for Bruce Willis to be a comedic actor rather than a, a dramatic actor. Well, well, he was a great comedy actor in um, the TV show that he used to be in with Sybil Shepherd, Moonlighting. That's where he got right. his start, um, was in comedy, I think. But, but you're right, he sort of has that role um, in cinema. And then in 1999, he's perhaps trying to redefine his role because he is, of course, in one of the big movies of the year, which I won't name, um, ah. but we'll, we'll get to it, it eventually. We also see the same happening with Tom Cruise, which Tom Cruise is perhaps the last big Hollywood star um, because a lot of actors these days have become characters. You know, they're more known for the character that they play, you know, with all these Marvel movies and things like that. But Tom Cruise is in two of the really good movies of 1999, 
where he probably went, it's probably the year where he went the most extreme playing against his usual type. So instead of being a, an action hero, he was playing these dramatic roles. Yeah, you're, uh, you're, you're right, I think. I think Tom Cruise is one of the last Hollywood A-listers, really, isn't he? Mm. He's, like, he's from a different generation to a lot of the other uh, stars of today who, honestly, you're right, I could name their character, but I, I'm not sure I could name the the person behind it as quickly. Yeah, right? or, or you'd be hard-pressed to, fight, to name five movies mm. that they were in that weren't, uh, you know, Marvel franchise movies, for example. That, Yeah, that's right, yeah. Another one that I'd be interested in seeing, I'm not sure whether you've seen it, is The Astronaut's Wife, which is Johnny um, Depp and Charlize Theron. Yeah, I saw that one in the list. That's another one that I've heard of, but ha- I haven't watched. And I, and I think... It might have been because that was pretty late in the year in 1999 and I had some uh, personal life stuff going on at that time. So it would probably have been one that uh, with the arrival of our first child. So that would have been one that I might have missed just because of uh, having a uh, a very small baby at the time. Yeah, I, that's one I, I've heard of subsequently but not, not seen. But mm. that, yeah, again, Johnny Depp's another massive uh, actor. Even now, he's always in the news. And then you've got who was the who was the actress in that it was one? Charlize guy? Theron. So, well, yeah, I mean, and she's massive as well, and she's still um, she's still a, a big in movies today. Oh, you still hear her name quite regularly. So, yeah. So yeah. the two the two uh, of them on the space shuttle and it sounds interesting. I'm curious. There's the movie Eight Millimeter, which is an interesting one as well. Uh, that's got Nicolas Cage in it, I think, uh, right. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, uh, I mean, he's another A-list actor, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. As well as James that, Gandolfini that, and, and Wacken Phoenix. How do you pronounce his name? <laughs> uh, but yeah, big actors, and that's a Joel yes. Shoemaker movie as well, and, and in some ways channeling the movie Seven, I always thought. Nicolas Cage is the, uh, the, the leading star. Certainly he's the one on all the advertising. Um, so I don't know if um, – are you going to make me pronounce this as well? Uh, Joe Quinn Phoenix, is it? I, I Gosh, we, we're yeah, really I have no idea, it, aren't we? But, of course, he's, but James, he's just been was in James Napoleon. Gandolfini, was James Gandolfini big in 99? I, I don't remember when The well, Sopranos I, came out. The Sopranos started in 99, I'm pretty sure. So Right. But I don't know that it took off until later. Probably not. I it would have been a slow I, burn, yeah. A lot of the other, a lot of the rest of the cast. Looking at the list, they're pretty forgettable. I, mm. uh, though, there's a couple of real character act- actors there. Anthony Heald, his face looks very familiar, and there's a few others that are who look very, very familiar. Yeah, Catherine um, Catherine Keener is in this movie. She's also in one on my A list, which we'll discover right. as we go through. But, but I think yeah, I'd always. I've never seen 8mm, but I'd always put it in the same bucket as the movie 7, which came out in 95, I think. And it just looked like an attempt to cash in on that same style of movie, like this confrontational, like disturbing, that sort of thing. Actually, Uh, speaking of big stars, just looking at Instinct, that's, uh, that's got Anthony Hopkins, who again was probably a pretty huge actor at the time. And um, Cuba, Cuba Gooding Jr., who I feel like was also pretty uh, well known around that time as well. I don't know uh, if Silence of the Lambs had already come out at this point. And that would have been my... that would have been a decade before, I'm sure. But this this looks like Silence of the Lambs rehashed, doesn't it? Does it's, yeah, it does. And that, and that is in prison. Have, yeah, and it, and it may well be that's why it, it crashed because it's a bit of a remake of a, a previous character. Donald Sutherland is in this as well. I mean, Donald Sutherland. So, again, uh, this is one of the things about this F-list. The more you look at this F-list, the more you see a a lot of very talented big names, and yet they're in questionable (laughs) questionable movies. So Mm -hmm. I guess that still happens today. But, I mean, the F-list has some – like, if you're going on star power, you would say that the F-list was a shoe-in. Like, they're all – The General's Daughter is Travolta as well, isn't it? So, is that right? And I think also uh, the Australian actor is in that one as well. Uh, the Australian the guy actor. from the, um, you know, the one from the the pig movie. Uh, <laughs> what, James, what's that? What's James the, Cromwell. Yeah, he's actually he's well, actually he's, in he's the not trailer. Australian, but he's 
been in oh, Australian sorry. He, movies. He's a, is, he, is he a New Zealander that we've adopted, is he? No, well, he, uh, he was born in America. Well, there you go. I've just learned something new. There you go. Oh, mm. I thought he was Australian. Oh, there you go. Well, thank you, Jason. I've well, I, I get confused about uh, actors as well all the time. There's a lot of English actors that I, I thought were American because I, I've only really ever he, seen them in, in Hollywood movies. I honestly thought he was Australian. There you go. There well, you, you go. learn something. That's, that's what's great about this podcast. You're <laughs> learning. <laughs> he was in LA Confidential in 1997. Was, yeah, yeah and, with, uh, with two Australian actors. So there you go. Maybe and, you thought that was an Australian movie. So just to wrap things up, um, there's one movie on the list, Jawbreaker, which I'd never heard of. And it didn't cross my path at all when I was putting together my list. But the reason why I've included it is I've been reading this really good book called Best Movie Year Ever, How 1999 Blew Up the Big Screen. It's by someone called Brian Raftery. And he was on a podcast recently um, talking about the book. And he said, after writing the book, where he goes through a lot of the big movies from 1999, the number one bit of feedback he received from uh, the readership was, why didn't you include Jawbreaker, which is apparently is a bit of a cult classic. The, uh, the blurb for this movie is, three of the most popular girls at Reagan High accidentally kill the prom queen with a jawbreaker when a kidnapping goes horribly wrong. Now, I'm not sure I know what a jawbreaker is, but... Um, I think it's I'm, one of those those lollies, um, like a large, hard ball of sugar, which takes forever to to eat. Ah, that so would explain you, all the lollies on the uh, poster for the movie. Okay, that that makes sense. Yeah, now. yeah, right. I think this might be a case of a, a movie attaining cult status because it's so horribly bad. It's certainly going to be one that I I find time to watch during. 2024. Rose McGowan, Rebecca Gayhart, and Julie Benn, three ladies that I have never really heard of before or since, I suspect. I think they were picked because they probably fit a stereotype. You've got a redhead, a brunette, and a blonde. Uh So uh, I suspect there was a bit of stereotyping going on. Again, this is the 1990s. uh, No, no. But, uh, yeah. It does look... Like similar to that movie Heather's uh, back in the day, was that Winona Ryder and and so forth? Yeah, I think it takes a dark turn, and I, you know, that's what Heather's mm. did. So, sort of taking that as the formula for the movie, but then taking it in a in an unexpected direction, perhaps. So, but anyway, we'll find out more about it uh, in the new year. Yeah. I think that pretty much wraps up our F list. I will publish the entire list of 26 movies that didn't make it to my A list or my B list. I'll publish them in the podcast notes. So if people want to go through and watch the trailers and and watch those movies themselves, if our discussion has sparked any interest. But I think we're getting close to the end of this episode. So like I said, this is the our pilot episode. We didn't have a movie to review. But how things are going to work in the future is the next episode um, from here will be released on maybe the 7th of January. What we're going to do is we're going to have a movie night at my house, select a random movie to watch from my A list of of 52 movies. We're going to watch it on the spot and then we'll review it in the following week. And that gives everyone a chance to watch it after we've revealed what the movie is. So in order for us to have a movie to review in next week's episode, before we've actually had one of these movie nights, I wanted to select a movie that I was disappointed didn't make the cut to my A-list, um, just on a technicality. And that movie is Princess Mononoke, a Studio Ghibli ah, movie. Mm. Now, the reason why that didn't make the cut is it was a 1997 movie um, released in Japan in 1997. It was a candidate for 1999 because that's when we would have seen it. Um, It got a theatrical release in 1999 in the US um, because Disney came along and recorded the English language dub um, using some big name actors uh, with a script that was written by Neil Gaiman, who was uncredited. So it is a really good dub if you normally watch subtitles and, and not the dubbed version. Probably Princess mm. Mononoke is one of those animes where it's worth listening to the dub. I must admit, I, uh, I'll i have to watch the dub version because I don't think 
I've ever watched uh, Princess Mononoke with, with the dub. So, because uh, like you said, I, I, I have this habit of watching the Japanese one with subtitles. Um, so I'll have to have a look at that one. I think that's is that would I be correct in thinking that's on Netflix, Joe? Yeah, that's on Netflix, and I did recently watch it with my son. Um, so it's fresh in my mind. I don't think it actually came to Australia until until two thousand and one. So that's when we would have seen it in the cinema. I'm pretty sure we would have gone to see it. Yeah, I don't think I saw it with you. If I if I saw it with anyone, I I would have seen it with our good friend David. This one is really a dark movie. It's a very adult movie. I don't think we allowed our kids to watch it when they were younger, um, even though they would have watched most uh, Studio Ghibli movies apart from Grave of the Fireflies, which they'll probably never watch. But uh, Princess Mononoke is dark. The motivations of the characters are very... Like, it's very adult in that sense. There's no black and white good and evil in that movie as well. But the animation is is astounding, and they were using some CGI back then as well, so some good examples of blending CGI into hand-drawn uh, animation. Well, and I th- we'll, we'll have to review it in more detail. We'll review uh, it next give, week, I think, so, so yeah, let's, let's, not, let's, uh, not give, <laughs> let's not give too much away, Jaso. But um, I, I'm going to go, go away and watch that movie this week. Um, well, and, uh, what I'll do right now is I'll play the trailer for people to listen to. So I'll edit that into the podcast. So, so let's do that now. In a time when gods walk the earth, an epic battle rages between the encroaching civilization of man and the gods of the forest. When the forest has been cleared and the wolves wiped out, this place will be the richest land in the world. <laughs> Now, the fate of the world rests on the courage of one fearless princess. I'm not afraid to die, and I would do anything to get the humans out of here. And one brave warrior. You fight like a demon, boy. Like something possessed. What exactly are you here for? To see with eyes unclouded by hate. Now watch closely, everyone. I'm going to show you how to kill a god. Fire! Billy Crudup, Claire Danes, Minnie Driver, Jada Pinkett Smith, and Billy Bob Thornton. You cannot alter your fate, however. You can rise to meet it if you choose. Princess Mononoke. Okay, so let's wrap things up. Happy New Year to you, Craig. It's, we're recording this on New Year's Eve. Happy New Year to you, Jason. And I look forward to a great year of watching movies together. So I'll see you at my place this time next week. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Goodbye. And now for the bit you've all been waiting for. It's blooper time. Feeling I'm not going to have a great day today. And the classic this week is... Sorry, I've messed up. (laughs) I'm just trying to react the way I did before. (laughs) Shush. I do it to irritate you. I know, so stop it. Why? Can we do it again? Oh, no, come on, guys. I've worn these a zillion times before on screen. And I don't want to make excuses. Well, don't make excuses. Well, but I'm going to. Okay. (laughs) Have you laid an egg? <laughs>